was a beautiful song. I know John Millet from many, many years ago. Such a blessing to have him here. I feel like I need to have like a revenge moment for that little stunt type pulled. <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, I, I couldn't think of anything. And I couldn't pull up any pictures because Ty is kind of a secretive type of guy, you know. So there's no evidence. There's no evidence trail. But um, I'm blessed to be able to study Exodus chapter 2 with you uh, tonight. And I feel like these two presentations are really setting the stage for this unraveling of this, this incredible narrative that we are journeying together. And so for my presentation, I'm going to walk through through the second chapter of this incredible book. In my reading, rereading of the book of Exodus, I was struck with how crazy this thing takes off. The book of Exodus almost comes to an end before it's even able to begin. I imagined, and maybe, it was, maybe it's because of my flight out here, I imagined the book of Exodus, like chapter 2, like a plane, and it's peeling down the runway, and it's trying to take off, and it's under attack, and there are missiles being shot at this plane, and it's shaking, and the, 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 the runway, is, 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 it's got bombs ripping it up as this plane is just trying to take off, and as it takes off, the, the, the wheels blow out, and there's missiles that barely miss it, and it just barely catches elevation and, and breaks through the clouds. I think that's like... Exodus chapter 2 summarized. <clears throat> the whole thing is crazy. It's, it's, and the only reason you're not freaking out about it is because you've read ahead. Am I right? But imagine yourself reading this story for the first time, for the first sitting. It is a nail-biting start to this story. Now here's what I'm going to lay out to you this evening for our study tonight. This book that we are studying for this convocation is filled with the supernatural. The book of Exodus is saturated with the miraculous. It's saturated with sensational, mind-bending miracles that suspend nature. But not tonight. None of that shows up in the second chapter of Exodus. Now, of course, you're going to say, well, God is behind the scenes. God is present. Of course, God is present. But I want to bring to your attention the way in which the book communicates how God is present. There are no superpowers manifested in Exodus chapter 2. Now, there will be. We will be, having, we will be partying all week long celebrating these, these miraculous stories. But in Exodus chapter 2, in my chapter tonight, there is none of that. And that's my sermon. Because Exodus chapter 2, and if you can wrap your mind around this concept, Exodus chapter 2 highlights the common. The what, everybody? The common. The seemingly insignificant. This is the emphasis of this chapter. But it highlights the common by pro portraying it as stunning. By portraying the common, the seemingly insignificant, as courageous and as powerful. So this is the, this is the lens through which we are looking at Exodus chapter 2. That Exodus chapter 2 is a reframing of what power looks like from Yahweh's perspective. What do we have in Exodus chapter 2? We don't have any magic tricks. We don't have any abracadabras. That comes later. In Exodus chapter 2, what do we have? Moms being moms. Daughters being daughters. Sisters being sisters. In Exodus chapter 2, compassion, human dignity, Human decency, those are the superpowers that God communicates in the beginning of the story. The very chapter where the very life of the deliverer lies in the balance. The very chapter where we would want God to unleash 
All the magic tricks he has up his sleeve is the very chapter where those things are specifically absent from the narrative. And in my reading, that sets the stage for the significance of why the book of Exodus begins this way. Because that is a message that, that the author is trying to communicate to us because the author knows that what comes and on the other side of that door from after, after Exodus chapter 2 is an onslaught of all of these miracles. And, but I want you to notice and celebrate with me tonight the different story that is told here in this chapter. Now, Exodus chapter 2, obviously, is, is only understandable in the context of what just came before it. Now, Ty has done some heavy lifting already in setting a bit of the context. So I'm going to bring you back there to tell you something about this setting that we, that we are introduced to before we get into Exodus chapter 2. Now, we're told in, in chapter 1, verse 8, that a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. I went with the NIV here because I love that translation of that text. A new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Now, your translation may say that a new king came to power who did not know Joseph, right? Now, put that in your pocket because if I make it there to the end of this presentation, I'm going to ask you to pull that back out. And you'll see how this just wraps up in an intentional way, the way this book is written. We have this story of a new pharaoh that comes into power that breaks precedent with the policies of the previous pharaohs that came before him. Now to this pharaoh, the Hebrew, foreigner, the, the Hebrew foreigners, this foreign population in his land is making him nervous. He views the Hebrew foreigners as a threat. There are too many of them. But he has a dilemma in his hands because he can't simply kick out these he Hebrew foreigners because they are, they are essential to the Egyptian economy. The Hebrew foreigners are instrumental to the prosperity of the land in Egypt. So he's got a dilemma. There are too many of them, and he fears that in the case of war or internal strife or a foreign policy crisis, that this foreign population in his land would turn against the Egyptians. So fear strikes at the highest levels of Egyptian government. And that fear, imagine the propaganda here, trickles down to Egyptian society and Egyptian popular opinion. And everything is, is set against this this population in the land. So there's a decree that is issued. And the decree says that every uh, daughter of Israel that is born is to be preserved alive, but all Hebrew boys are to be killed. And, and you've heard about this already. It is in the midst of this crisis that, that Moses is born, that Moses comes into the picture. So that's just the stage for the background of Exodus chapter 2. Now, the first thing that strikes the reader when they enter into the, into the territory of Exodus chapter 2, the first thing that strikes the reader, at least this reader, is the way that the author of this book introduces us to the main heroes of the book of Exodus. Now, if you lined up 10, 20, 50 Christians, show up at any church in town, any given day, and ask the audience, who is the central hero in the book of Exodus? Or when you think of book of Exodus, who is the, the, the protagonist that comes to mind? And we would all naturally say Moses. But I think it's fascinating that the way the, the author of, of Exodus presents this entire narrative of this whole book is completely contrary to what we would have expected. The protagonists that we are presented with are Pua. <laughs> She's like, that's exactly what I was like, what? <laughs> Pua, Shifra, Jochebed. You know, a clue I'm talking about, do you? Miriam, a little more familiar. Pharaoh's daughter, a little more familiar. How many people, if you line them up and ask them, who is the hero of the book of Exodus? Pua. <laughs> I'll give you a million dollars. 
Well, I don't have a million. Light bears will give you a million dollars. I literally just said that. I can't believe that. You will not find a soul that will say, Pua, Jochebed. We don't have a clue who these people are or who these names represent. And that's why I'm standing in front of you this evening. Because according to Exodus chapter 2, these are the protagonists of the book of Exodus that even make the book of Exodus possible. Can you say amen to that? This is what we're looking at. And wh who are these people? We have mothers, wives, midwives. We have sister. We have daughter. These are seemingly insignificant individuals that according to Exodus chapter 2, that Yahweh is going to reframe our conception of where power truly lies. Now actually, uh, Pua and Chifra, they're in Exodus chapter 1. And Ty made a pact with me that he wouldn't mention their names. Now, in Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh calls into his chambers Pua and Shifra. Now, they are the representatives of the Hebrew, the network of Hebrew midwives. Now, they are called, and they are the ones that are given the decree to put to death the Hebrew boys. Now, I want you to notice that Pharaoh doesn't communicate to them his decree through an intermediary, he calls them into his physical presence. Why? What you're reading is that Pharaoh, the most powerful power, the most powerful king, the, most, the, the representative of the most powerful kingdom of the time, is calling these two ladies in front of him into his presence because he's trying to intimidate them. And the way that the text spins is, is, is just fascinating. It says, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king commanded them. Now, that's a text that we just read through way too quickly. And we, and we don't savor the significance of how, of, of how powerful those words actually are. Okay? Now, one historian of ancient law has surveyed the laws of antiquity, and he's come to this conclusion that the midwife's resistance right there in Exodus chapter 1 is the oldest record in world literature of the spurning of a governmental decree. How cool is that? There is no other record that predates these two ladies. What, what are their names again? You're going to remember that tonight, aren't you? You will never forget those two names. Pua, Shifra. How awesome is that? There is no known record in world literature that predates the stand that these two ladies made before the greatest potentate of the time. Now, in the 1960s, there was a award, the Shifra and Pua Award, that was given to, to honor, uh, to recognize nonviolent resistance to tyranny. Now, the story goes, uh, in Exodus chapter 2, do you have your Bibles with you? I'm assuming some of you brought your Bibles. In Exodus chapter 2, I'm going to read here the first bit, and we're going to walk through uh, this chapter with me. If you're in Exodus chapter 2, can you say hallelujah? That's how you say it out here, right? Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Exodus chapter 2, verse 2. You ready? My Bible says this. A woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds of the river's bank. And his sister stood afar to know what would be done to him. Now pause right there. How many of you get the feeling that, that this was a bit of a clever move because the decree said to put the children into the river. So in a sense, this Hebrew mom, who, by the way, what's her name? Jochebed. Now, she's unnamed in our passage here, but she is named explicitly in Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, if you're taking notes, and Numbers chapter 26. This is Jochebed. This is Mama Jochebed. You'll hear about her a bit more tonight. Now, it's interesting that the decree said put the children into the river. So in a sense, Jochebed could have said, Pharaoh, you told us and commanded us to put the boys into the river. So 
I put the boy into the river, right? Now, continue reading here, verse 5. Now, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, okay? And I want you to... I want you to be suspicious and curious as we read. Does this sound like a happy coincidence, right? The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens, or her servants, walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him, and she said to herself, this is one of the Hebrews' children. We're coming back to that. Verse 7, Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said, Yes, go. So So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Right Now this sister, her name is? Miriam. Right? A whole lot of women going on here, right? Sister's name is Miriam, and Miriam has this clever idea, this proposition, and Pharaoh's daughter takes the bait, and she says, yes, verse 9. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away. Now she's talking to Jochebed, mom. Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. And so the woman took the child and nursed him. Now, how many of you are a bit suspicious here? It seems to me... That for people living in that region, is it possible that the timing of Pharaoh's daughter's river bath was known to people in the region? We're we're seeing here ingenuity. We're seeing here vision. We're seeing here creativity. And Miriam, little Miriam shows up into the picture. And, And she is the sister. And we don't know her age. But she's, scholars think she, what, 12, 13 judging from the, from the future narrative of Exodus, and she's this little girl, this, this early teen at best, and she's playing this role. Now, Miriam, throughout the narrative of the prophets, the later prophets look back and they view Miriam more than just a, side, a sidekick to Moses and, and Aaron. Notice what it says here in Micah chapter 6. When the later prophets look back at Miriam, it says this, this is... Micah quoting God himself, God speaking, I brought you, Israel, up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Ariam, Aaron, excuse me, and Miriam. You follow me? I don't know if you're following what I'm saying here. Who delivered Israel out of Egyptian bondage? God. Who did God use to deliver Israel out of Egyptian bondage? The natural knee-jerk reaction is... Moses, right? Moses was the one that God called to deliver. But here in Micah chapter 6, we hear that not only Moses is singled out, but Miriam is singled out as a deliverer of Israel. How awesome is that? So you see here that this woman, this Hebrew mom, would have known, would have likely known the timing of of Pharaoh's daughter's bath And she decided to take this huge risk in hopes that it would somehow tug at the heart of a human being. Now, this is amazing. The the events that are happening here that are chronicled here by these seemingly insignificant women have actually a broader theological significance. Because when you look at the thematic uh, similarities between how do the women behave in Exodus... And how does Yahweh behave in Exodus? You will see that the women are basically forecasting the work of Yahweh, right? Now, I'll get to that in a second. Here's the reversing the threat. The threat was twofold. The royal family and the river. The threat to Israel came from the royal family and the river. It was from the very sources of the threat that God orchestrated deliverance. Is that true? Pharaoh's chosen instrument of destruction was denial. The river now becomes the instrument for saving Moses. A member of the royal family, Pharaoh's daughter, becomes the conduit for his deliverance. So you're seeing a reversal that's taking place in these texts. Now, this, this passage here is, uh, 
is significant in many ways. I read this, but I'm putting it on the screen for emphasis. We're told that when Pharaoh's daughter opened that little ark. By the way, ark, you know there's only two places that that Hebrew word for ark is found in the Old Testament. It's here and in Noah's story of Noah's ark. Now, you judge for yourself if there's a play going on here. That in the first instance where an ark is used, right, an ark is used to deliver those inside the ark while those outside the ark experience destruction. But here the author of Exodus is doing a reversal because here an ark is being used to deliver someone inside the ark for the sake of delivering those outside of the ark. You follow me? So Pharaoh's daughter opens it. She sees the child and she sees the child weeping. And the Bible says that she has what, everybody? Compassion. And it connects her compassion to the fact that she realizes that this was one of the Hebrew women's children. This is a huge passage for me as I studied Exodus chapter 2. I want you to notice that this is a heathen woman. She's one of the unsung heroes of the Exodus story. She understands the circumstances that would have led a mother to take her, her child and to, and, to, and to risk her child on the banks of some river. Pharaoh's daughter is standing in front of that ark and, and she's connecting these dots. And she has compassion, which tells me that she's entering into the, the circumstances that would have led someone to this moment of desperation. She is from the oppressive ruling class, and yet she is capable of having compassion and recognizing human dignity. She's from the enemy's camp. Exodus chapter 2 is alerting the reader that there are people on the other team that are actually on God's team. Are you with me? They may be on the other team in respect to you as the reference point. But because they are on another team in your personal perception of the situation, doesn't mean they're not on God's team. Amen? This should caution us. Am I sweating? That's my brother, Yamil. Give it up for Yamil, everybody. Give it up for Yamil. So this lady, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, is, is disrupting the narrative. Why? She is disrupting the us versus them. Now, here's the crazy thing. The book of Exodus is premised on, on the Israelites being delivered by these, from these brutal people, the Egyptians. We get so much of that. These brutal people on the other side of the aisle, right? And yet, the thing begins by disrupting the, the notions of us versus them. Because it's one from the other side. Listen, what would this Pharaoh's daughter, I wish we knew her name, what would, what would she have, have had to have, sur have surmount in order to make the decision that she made? Can you imagine the pressure that she was under? Can you imagine the cultural pressure? The pressure from her political affiliation. All of which dictated that she should hate those people, the Hebrews. And this woman from the royal class has to surmount and somehow move beyond all of that. Is this remarkable or is this remarkable? Yeah. Pharaoh's daughter settles it in her own heart that among the people who her people consider the enemies, that there are human beings worthy of compassion and human decency. In Exodus chapter 2, the Hebrew women were together with Egyptian women. Check this out. This is from Terence Pretium. He's an he's a Old Testament scholar. Basic human values such as compassion, justice, and courage, as well as the active subversion of cruel and inhumane policies are seen to be present among God's creatures 
quite apart from their relationship to Israel. That is a very scholarly and dry way of saying God has people that are not in Israel. Are you listening to me? That compassion, justice, courage, those are characteristics of Yahweh. Yes? There are people who reflect characteristics of Yahweh that are not in Israel. Are you with me? In fact, in the next chapter, which I'm not preaching on, we find Moses at the burning bush. He's in, he's in alien territory. He is, in, he is on foreign land. And a bush appears to him in, 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 the, in the burning bush, and God speaks out of the burning bush, and he says, take your shoes up because you're on what kind of ground? Holy, Holy ground. But wait, he's on foreign alien territory. And yet God tells him that that ground he's standing on is what, everybody? Holy. Holy. And I love how John Stott put it. You ready? There was holy ground outside the holy land. We, what's the message? We have no monopoly on God's people. What's Exodus chapter 2? What's, what's the first item on the agenda of Exodus chapter 2 to completely shatter your conceptions and my conceptions of who God's people really are? Because according to this narrative, God's circle is much larger than our own. So these women are just blowing my mind. In this narrative, in this story, the men are virtually, what everybody, absent. Women take the stage front and center. Now, it's funny that when you read Hebrews chapter 11, the New Testament writers look back at this and they're like, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, which we'll get to tonight, and, 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 and the author of Hebrews 11, he's writing down the story of, of mighty Moses and he gets to the point where he has to tell the story of when Moses was a child and he was delivered. And he's like, and, and the mother, Jacob, and he's like, man, this looks bad. So the parents of Moses, <laughs> literally what he does. It says the parents in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, I'll let you do with that whatever you want. I reckon the guy got a little nervous because he's realizing, man, what does this look like? The men are virtually absent from Exodus chapter 2, which is fascinating because, again, remember what this is all premised by. It is a reframing of what the world considers powerful, not the miraculous superpowers that we will read about, but the, the common the seemingly insignificant, right? The superpowers are compassion and human dignity. This is what pushes the story forward. So the Old Testament, the Old Testament is, is it, it, this is the Old Testament. That one, that testament, that, those books, those, those misogynistic books. You know what I'm talking about. Those books that the great women, now listen, I'm not making light of this. Half of the Old Testament have no clue what's going on. Me, no clue. It's a difficult, right? But what are we reading here? This is the Old Testament and how, how progressive, how ahead. Exodus chapter 2, I find this interesting. Now in the New Testament, side note, we also have a similar situation. Who kicks off the story of the New Testament? Who are the original witnesses of the resurrection? Who are the original witnesses of, of, the, of the gospel promises that are fulfilled? It's women. I found this somewhere. I don't know who, who in the world put this up, but I found this. And I don't know if you can read this, but it says, here's a picture of, of the New Testament scene. Here are the women, and here are the dudes in the New Testament. And it says in the bottom, so ladies, thanks for being the first to witness and report the resurrection. And we'll take it from here. Now, I'm not here to beat anybody up. But you tell me that I'm taking the text out of context. You tell me that. You tell me that I'm reading Exodus chapter 2 and I'm not reading something that's putting the women front and center. Because the point that Yahweh is making is a powerful point. Okay, so here's what I was getting at earlier. The thematic similarities. What the women are doing are forecasting what Yahweh does. Women rescue Moses through water. Exodus 2. God rescues the Hebrews through water. We'll get to that. Women place Moses among the reeds of the river. We just read that. God delivers the Hebrews at the Red Sea, or is it the Sea of Reeds? It's the Sea of Reeds. Are you getting the connection here? Is this a coincidence? 
Pharaoh's daughter came down, quote, and, quote, saw the baby, and then, quote, sent to rescue him. God later, quote, came down and, quote, saw Israel's plight, and then he sent Moses to rescue them. Is this a coincidence? What are the superpowers in Exodus chapter 2? According to what we're reading, it, it's mom being mom, sisters being sisters, wives being wives. These are the superpowers here. Why are the daughters allowed to live? Why does the decree go towards the males? Because the women are perceived to be weak. They are perceived to be a non-threat. And here's the spin. They happen to be the greatest threat to Pharaoh's policy. You follow me? And now here's a historian from Harvard University, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Now back, I think in the 60s, she wrote an essay where she coined this line, well-behaved women seldom make history. And what happened was this took off, it became a slogan, t-shirts and bumper stickers, and people went and ran with it. But they misinterpreted what she was actually saying. They thought that, that Ulrich was, was making a call, a summons, to women to stop being well-behaved. What she was actually saying was way more powerful and provocative than that. It wasn't a summons. It was a complaint. She's historian of American history at Harvard University. What she was saying was, is that she was complaining that historians only pay attention to women throughout history who are scandalous and who engage in outrageous behavior. Only then do they come under the purview of historical inquiry. She was saying... We're missing an incredible opportunity because studying women, ordinary women, whatever that is, normal women, she says, holds the key to explain why the world is the way that it is. You understand? It wasn't a summons. It was a complaint. Now, you can interpret this whatever way you want. Maybe you're one of them with the bumper sticker. <laughs> you know? Took this as a summons. And you're going to get home tonight and you're going to... Get me in trouble with your husband, right? But here's the thing. <laughs> but you take it however you want to take it. But when I read Exodus chapter 2, I'm reading a list of protagonists, and they don't fit the mold. Now, here's a feminist theologian. She wrote an article called Bringing Miriam Out of the Shadow. She's, she said, um, if Pharaoh had recognized the power of women, he might well have reversed his decree and had daughters killed rather than sons. <laughs> I was like, all right, you have my attention. But the story moves. Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. And the child grew, and she, Jochebed, brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son, and she called his name Moses because I drew him out of the water. Now, here's, this is crazy. We don't know. We think around 12 years old when Jochebed, Mama Jochebed, handed over Moses to Pharaoh's daughter. 12 years old-ish, scholars believe. When Mama Jochebed was given her little baby back, she knew that the clock was ticking. She knew that she had a very limited period of time to prepare Moses to enter into the Egyptian world, the Egyptian life, right? What did she do? How did she prepare Moses? I reckon that she took that time to instill within Moses the importance of what it means to be an Israelite, to be someone who comes from the heritage of the promises of Yahweh. Identity was an issue here, right? And how do we know that? Because we see this play out immediately uh, in the aftermath of what the, next, the text says next. One day, now this is crazy, from verse 10... To verse 11, years have gone by. One day, Moses was all grown up. Now, uh, if you're taking notes, write down Acts chapter 7. What is it? I don't remember. Acts 7, 23. He's 40 years old. One day, right? Moses is now 40 years old. He's all grown up. And he goes out to where his, his what, everybody? His own people were. And he watched them at their hard labor. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his, what, everybody? 
Now, why am I emphasizing that? Because, it, because, because the text emphasizes that. And why does the text emphasize that? Because the text is trying to emphasize the issue of identity. Moses, at some point, goes public. And he decides that he is an Israelite. He identifies with the Hebrews. But this was likely simmering for a long time. Why? Because Jochebed had that time with him to prep him for this. Now, when you read the New Testament, and when the New Testament prophets infuse this story with theological significance, you get stuff like this. This is Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to what it says. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. I'm getting to some of these points here in the next few minutes, but listen to what I'm saying here. How many of you think this is a remarkable stance that, that Moses took? Imagine the glory, the wealth, the fame the unrestricted pleasure of all kinds that lay at his fingertips. And for Moses to have the moral character to take a stand and say, I am not Pharaoh's daughter, right? Think of how remarkable this passage is. And we think, wow, Moses is awesome. Can you say amen to that? Yeah, that was a trap. I wanted you to say amen. Because we can say Moses is awesome, or, or, or is it really <clears throat> Jochebed is awesome? <laughs> you follow me? Imagine when we get to the kingdom. I mean, everyone wants to chat with Moses. Moses is a superstar. We get to the kingdom, and Moses is there, and everyone's rushing. They're in a long line. And Moses, they all want his signature, right? And you get there, and you're running through the, through the pearly gates. And Moses is there. He's like, yeah, yeah. He sees the guy running. He's assuming, I have my pen. You want an autograph, right? And you get there. You're like, can you get out of the way? I'm looking for Jochebed. <laughs> So, so, really, what are we reading here? We're reading that here's the residual effects of the superpowers of Exodus chapter 2. Amen? This is the residual effects. So, Moses makes a decision here. Notice how this text, notice the, 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 the content of this text. Notice the pieces here. He refuses to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he's, he's juxtaposing, to, he's, he's comparing two things, right? The suffering. The affliction with God's people, right, versus enjoying pleasure of sin. The parallel comparison, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And here's, how, here's what I wrote down. The worst with God is better than the best with this world. That's what Mama Jacobit taught. Amen? The worst with God is better than the best with this world. Now, this reminds me of a whole ton of verses, which I won't burden you with, except for this one. Psalm 84, verse 10. Just one day in the courts of your temple is greater than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather serve as a porter at my God's doorstep than to live in luxury in the house of the wicked. How powerful is that? What if Moses would have decided to stay in Egypt? He'd be in some undiscovered tomb somewhere. Or maybe he'd be in the British Museum. You can go and, watch and, 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 and see the display, right? And yet the text says that Moses, where, where, where does the Bible say Moses is? Moses' grave ain't around, if you know what I mean, right? This idea of, of the weight of what is sacrifice. What does sacrifice even mean? This, this just throws the concept of sacrificing for God, spins it on his head, doesn't it? Is there even any such thing as sacrificing for God? Sacrificing, by definition, is you're giving, something of, giving up something of value for something else, right? But, but in the grand scheme of eternity that Moses enters into, that reality, he's giving up the glories of Egypt for something else, and it doesn't equate as a sacrifice. You follow what I'm saying? It doesn't equate to this. This is a famous Jim Elliott quote. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. This is, this is the realm that Moses is in, and the story moves forward. Listen to what the next, the next verse says. 
identity was not the only thing that Moses picked up on in his childhood. He makes some grave mistakes, but under those mistakes is a legitimate expression of the heart of Yahweh. Check this out. So Moses goes out and he sees the abuse of his people. We've just read that. And then this verse 12 says, so he looked this way and he looked that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and, healed, and hid him in the sand. He's thinking he's doing something good. He's delivering his people, right? He goes out the next day. You know the, you know the text in verse 13, in verse, verses that follow this. He goes back out and he sees a Hebrew, but this time a Hebrew is mistreating another Hebrew. And Moses is thinking he's going to intervene. So he goes to intervene. And you remember what happens? The Hebrew says, who made you a prince or a king over us? What are you going to do? What are you going to do, Moses? You're going you're gonna to kill me too like you killed that, that Egyptian? If this was a movie, it's like, <laughs> Moses is thinking, they will understand what I'm doing. They will understand that I'm here to deliver them. But Moses completely blows it. Why? Because he relies on his own strength and on his own wits. And it's a miserable failure. Acts chapter 7, 24 and 25 says, it's kind of like a funny verse. It says, now Moses thought that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. And then it says, yeah, but they didn't understand that. <laughs> it makes perfect sense why Moses is not liked. Why Moses' actions are not received with open arms. Process this. An Egyptian overseer has been murdered. He's missing. Right? An investigation is surely going to ensue. And in the process of the investigation, it will be discovered which section of the workforce that overseer was in charge of. And he came out missing. And that investigation will likely lead to severe punishment. People are going to suffer as a result of Moses' rash actions. Are you with me? It makes perfect sense why, why he is not received as a rock star. It makes perfect sense why the people reject Moses' leadership. By the way, that, who made you a, a, a ruler over us, that is a forecast of the type of resistance Moses is about to experience for many chapters throughout. That mistake aside, I want you to notice here that there is a legitimate sense of justice that Moses experiences. He's exhibiting a legitimate sense of justice that actually Exodus will teach us, resides in the very heart of Yahweh, but he's expressing it in an illegitimate manner. Now, what is the legitimate sense of justice here? I want you to follow this here. That salvation, according to the book of Exodus, is not some personal spiritual uh, thing that you experience. That salvation, according to the book of Exodus, is a holistic reality that touches not only the spiritual, but it touches the physical. Are you hearing me? The word in the Old Testament for salvation uh, is, is, is a group of words around this root called yasa, right? Now, check this out. Here's a Hebrew scholar. He says, the most extensive and significant of the words for salvation in the Old Testament are yasa and its cognates. The basic meaning is that of, listen to this, being brought from a narrow or oppressive environment into a spacious one. So salvation in the Old Testament, the image is someone's getting choked. They can't, they can't move. And so the basic meaning is being brought into a spacious environment from bad into good circumstances where life flourishes and protection from enemies occurs. Now I'm going to jump to the New Testament here because the New Testament word for salvation is similarly holistic. When you read about salvation in the New Testament, it is not some personal, pious, spiritual thing merely. Salvation, the most prominent Greek word for salvation in the New Testament means to save and to deliver. Yes, that's true. But it also means to make whole. Salvation in the Bible is a holistic concept. It does not encompass merely the spiritual, but also the physical. Here's another way to put that. Salvation is directed not merely toward internal change, but toward societal change, the external conditions of life. 
And this includes the religious, the political, the social, and the individual. In other words, Exodus chapter 2, if you think about it, is premised with the idea that when God seeks to deliver people in Exodus, he didn't just send them a prophet that say, hey, you're, you're under bondage. Your external uh, conditions are awful. But don't worry. Hold on to the spiritual promise from Yahweh. It's going to be good in the afterlife. That's not the message from Exodus. The message from Exodus is that the deliverance that Yahweh offers touches the spiritual realm, but it also brings transformation to the physical and the social realms. Are you following what I'm saying? It is comprehensive. It is holistic. And that is such a powerful idea. A few more minutes with you to psychoanalyze Moses some more here. If it's true that salvation in the book of Exodus has a whole lot to do with this earth down here, right? This physical realm down here, and not just some future eternal pie in the sky, right? Then the, the message of the Old Testament is very forward-looking because even in modern times, we get the accusation that Christians, have you ever heard this before? Christians are too heavenly-minded that they are of no earthly good. Have you heard that before? And the idea there is that with all of the, the suffering and the injustices in the world down here, you have all these Christians who are fixated on a future world and completely ignore the issues of the present world. Are you with me? The assumption there is that the more you are fixated on the eternal on the spiritual promises of the kingdom of God, the less you will be interested about the conditions here on earth in the here and now. Exodus chapter 2 blows that out of the water. Why? Because when you read the New Testament, I, I told you in Hebrews chapter 11, we're told that Moses was laser sharp fixated. The text says that Moses took that stand to shun the treasures of Egypt because Moses was looking forward to the kingdom of God. Are you following what I'm saying? All of this um, earth, earthly transformation that takes place happens because Moses is so fixated in the heavenly realm. So check this out. This is C.S. Lewis. You guys okay? I have, I have two more slides and I'm done. Here's C.S. Lewis. A continual looking forward to the eternal world is not as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking. But it is one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most, of the, most for the present world were just those who thought most of the, what everybody? The next world. They all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this world. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get what, everybody? You will get neither. And, the, and I'll end the story there. I'll land the plane right there. From, from, from that moment of, of Moses expressing those sincere desires, he finds himself to have utterly failed and he flees to Arabia. He flees to Arabia. I think I noted that here. He, he, he flees to Arabia because, because he's, he's completely devastated and confused. And so he just ditches out into, into the desert. Now waiting for him there are, are another group of women who will cross paths with his life. And how many of them are there? There are seven, right? And we've just went through five women. And Exodus chapter 2 doesn't want to leave until he says, oh, by the way, before you stop, there's seven more women in his life. And that makes 12. I don't know what's going on here. Right. There's 12 women here. He's in Arabia and he's in darkness. He's devastated. He's an utter failure. And I remember I read somewhere that said, sometimes when you find yourself in a dark place, you think you've been buried but you've actually been planted. Remember that? But that seed that's planted in Arabia takes a long time to grow and to bear fruit. How long does it take? 40 years. 
And Moses' life is divided into three neatly 40-year blocks, right? He lives for 120 years. 40, 40, 40. 40 in Egypt. 40 in Arabia, the land of Midi in the Midians. And then 40 in the wilderness with the Israelites. 40, 40, 40. It's not until he is 80 years old that he goes back to Egypt to fulfill his role as a deliverer. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 80 years old. Now, I'm not a math guy. But that sounds like two-thirds into his life. And he's like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> two-thirds. Now, we don't live 120 years old. Our, our lifespan is different. I get that. What are we at? 80 years old, if, you, if you're good? If you're from Loma Linda, maybe like 300. But 80 <laughs> years old... That was a shout out to my peeps out in Loma Linda. But, but 80 years old? So, so two-thirds, what are we in our, in our mid-50s? Brothers and sisters, tonight, if you're discouraged because you don't have a clue what's going on in your life, but you have a heart that reverberates God, something that God is calling you, you haven't figured it out. And you're in your 50s. You weren't expecting that. You thought I was talking to the teenagers. You're in your 50s. Take heart. Amen? Because you're just barely getting to the two-thirds line. Amen? To land the plane here, Exodus offers a sobering portrait of the real world that we live in, the messiness of the human experience. And there is suffering in the book of Exodus. There's lots of it. In the, books of, the book of Exodus doesn't sugarcoat one ounce of it. It's ugly. It's a dark world that we live in. And we don't have a clue what's going on half the time, if you're honest. But in Exodus, God himself is in the shadows and he reveals the upheaval going on in his own heart. There are no superpowers, miraculous wonders, mind-bending miracles. We got compassion. We have human dignity. And those are the superpowers that God presents that will be the game changers in moving the story forward. And I'm excited to know where that story goes. Amen? Amen. Amen. And this is a superpower that God is calling each and every one of us to. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the vision of Exodus chapter 2. Thank you for these unsung heroes. Thank you that you identify the marginalized, those that are outside of of the public eye. And Father, that this is where you view true power. And we claim the promise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.